First, a uh, disclaimer. I will explore the causes of the popularity of a prominent figure, Imran Khan, while trying my best not to express political affiliations or biases. I will be focusing on the personality traits that have contributed to his popularity, the strategic marketing tactics he has employed to enhance his image, and the reasons behind his strong connection with the people of Pakistan. It's important to note that my analysis will be clear of political economic, social and global factors that made him emerge as Pakistan's Prime Minister in 2018. I won't be discussing his performance as a Prime Minister or his relations with the military establishment. Instead, I will concentrate on why he resonates so deeply with the masses and the tools, ideas and tactics that have propelled him to become an influential figure. Additionally, I won't be passing judgment on whether his actions are right or wrong, nor will I claim to know his real intentions because I don't know how to verify those. My focus is on understanding the phenomenon of his popularity and why his followers show extreme devotion even when they are presented evidence that proves that Imran Khan may not be as perfect as they imagine. I have tried to keep this analysis objective and academic. Having said that, there are 10 reasons why Imran Khan has emerged as the most popular personality in Pakistan from the year 2014 to the present day. The first reason is his successful career in cricket, which reached its peak when he led the Pakistan team to victory in the Cricket World Cup in 1992. Now, cricket is almost a second religion in South Asia, at least in India and Pakistan. And since 1992, cricket has become an inseparable part of his personality and those footages are still fresh in people's minds. But I do not find this explanation convincing for two reasons. One, there are many successful cricketers in Pakistan's history who did not achieve the popularity that Imran Khan has. And two, the generation that hailed Khan as a cricketing hero did not vote for him. It was the generation that was born after 1992 who did. In 1994, he established the Shokat Khanam Cancer Hospital, which contributed to his image of a bona fide and selfless philanthropist. However, I cannot see it as the sole reason either, because he did not reach the height of his popularity until 2014, 10 years after he had established the hospital. Still, his charity work did make him appear as an accomplished celebrity working selflessly for the welfare of people. But one of the most impactful strategies he used was the targeted marketing of his ideas through social media to four specific segments of Pakistan's population. The youth, the conservative Muslims, the lower middle class and the tribal belt of Pakistan. His first audience has been the youth. Pakistan's youth is largely dissatisfied, unemployed and discouraged. It comprises almost 44% of registered voters. He appealed to the youth by presenting himself as one of them, that is, as a fitness freak, as a strong man who can do lots of push-ups and who has conquered the world of cricket. Interestingly, this is not some ordinary youth. Largely, it is uneducated, lacks critical thinking, does not read books, has been instilled with ideology-pumping textbooks since its childhood, and easily falls prey to propaganda. The image of Imran Khan allows the youth to suspend the activity of that part of their brains, which induces rationality. Imran Khan's second audience has been the conservative Muslims, who envision him as an incorruptible leader, with a vision and a will to turn Pakistan into an Islamic welfare state, the Riyasat Madina. After decades of a lifestyle that had earned him a playboy image, he became a born again Muslim, who always recites the tasbih, prays regularly, speaks against Islam and calls Osama bin Laden a martyr. Who would not be fascinated with such fantasies? The third audience is the economically underprivileged class, people with limited financial means. In other words, the poor people who live hand to mouth. To him, he is a down-to-earth person who lives a simple life, bears shalwar kameez even at the UN, and eats whatever he is presented with. They see themselves in him, and they believe that he is the best person to represent them. The fourth audience is also the Muslims, but specifically those living in tribal belts. Those who have been ravished by the never-ending war on terror and its after-effects. And those who absolutely hate the United States of America for imposing this 
deaths and destruction on their loved ones. Imran Khan appealed to them by unequivocally opposing the war on terror. Uh, I have been opposing this. My political party has been opposing this, that violence only breeds more violence. I'm against military operations. I'm against the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan. It is, all it's doing is radicalizing Pakistanis. By targeting these four different audiences, he was able to relate to the majority of Pakistan's population. And he managed to overcome all ethnic and provincial borders while delivering his message through social media. The fourth reason is his vision. Imran Khan preached his utopian, unrealistic and overly simplistic vision to his followers. Inshallah, corruption. He said that once Pakistan gets rid of corruption, its condition will improve. But perhaps his followers do not know that governance is a whole different game. And statecraft is yet another. Interestingly, Imran Khan did not even mention in his speeches how he plans to get rid of corruption. He simply proposed that all opposition should be locked up and the masses believed him. Imran Khan knew very little about governance, but he did know that his audience probably know even less. Maybe he was following the footsteps of Adolf Hitler, who said that, I have the gift of reducing all problems to their simplest foundations. So Imran Khan sowed the vision in people's minds that one once an incorruptible person like him is elected to the top slot, his impact will move downwards, cleaning the system entirely. And as soon as the system is cleared of corruption, Pakistan will start making tremendous progress. The fifth reason is repetition. He repeated his vision again and again and again in every public gathering, press conference and interview for years. As they say, if something is repeated again and again, it becomes the truth. The sixth reason is creation of an enemy. A central requirement of leadership is to consolidate all followers under one roof, on one narrative, on one idea and against an opposing idea or an opposing group. For instance, Hitler once remarked that if the Jews had not existed, he would have to invent them, as it is essential to have a tangible enemy, not merely an abstract one. Another example of this concept is the famous phrase, rally round the flag, which means that when people face an external threat, they unite. While doing so, they set aside their differences. Imran Khan achieved this by creating an enemy in the form of certain political parties and their leaders who, in his opinion, are corrupt. And if they are eradicated from the political structure, all problems would be solved. The seventh reason is his opposition to elitism and dynastic politics. The problem in Pakistan is that we have what is called elite capture. The ruling elite is above law. So it's not just Pakistan's problem, it's the problem with the entire developing world. He knew that Pakistan's population, especially the youth, feels shut out of Pakistan's political system because someone in the family of dynastic parties always gets the top slot. Although Imran Khan belongs to the upper class elite of Pakistan, he does not come from a dynastic pack. Therefore, his followers expressed hatred against dynastic politics by staunchly supporting Imran Khan. The eighth reason is, of course, social media. In this case, Imran Khan and his party has been miles ahead of his competitors and rival parties. His party has utilized every technology available out there to propagate his message and vision to his followers. From virtual gatherings to mass content on platforms like TikTok and Facebook and X to generative AI, they have left no stone unturned. Meanwhile, the other parties fail to innovate and adapt and to take advantage of Pakistan's digital transformation. As a result, their campaign efforts prove to be less effective with a population that relies on technology for information and social interaction. Ninth, to add icing on the cake, Imran Khan is also a populist. Populism is a political approach in which a politician glorifies common people and opposes the manner in which the poor are exploited by corrupt economic and political systems and the equally corrupt elite controlling these systems. Donald Trump, for example, is a classic case study for understanding populism. But Imran Khan is said to be not only a populist, but an authoritarian populist, which means a populist that is also a strong man ruling the country. But here, a question arises, why would a strong man appeal to Pakistani people? The answer is found in the 10th reason, the strong man syndrome, explained in a book by Ian Kershaw, the Hitler myth. It is said to have occurred in a society in which people play 
place all hope, all power, and all authority in a single leader, in a strong man, in a charismatic figure. Such a society is, in most cases, pluralist, which means that it is composed of different ethnicities, religious sects, cultures, and interest groups. And since it fails to resolve its differences amicably or politically, it looks for a strong man who can set their house in order and remove their terminal crisis. Also, such glorification of strong men indicates that the society belongs to the third world country status. Let me know what you think down below in the comments and share this with someone who may find it interesting.